Sometimes, even though you may see the potential right in front of your face, you still second guess, do you have the potential, right? There's never going to be a straight path to anything you want in life. If God made the heart to go up and down, you don't think... You don't think he made your life to go up and down? We like to look at the shiny objects or we like to look at more glamorous parts. On Instagram, you wouldn't have noticed that anything was wrong. Your success for all these mini businesses comes from your childhood where you grew up in a very low income household. That I literally wrote a letter to my dad and was like, hey, if you don't come save me, I won't be here. If you buckle down and hunker in on what it is you're trying to do with this life, the world is endless. Mary Seats, also known as Ms. Skittles. Mary is the founder of several successful businesses, including the Bakery Cowork, the Icing Agency, Girl Mob, and Creamery Studios. This fearless entrepreneur has transformed a mere $300 investment into a multi-million dollar empire. The worst thing you can have is a great idea and bad marketing. And nowadays, it seems like making a million dollars is easy. Like, I see all the Instagram gurus, oh, I made a million in a day, I made a million in an hour. Well, back then it was not easy. I didn't know what burnout was, but I went through a situation where I'm like, literally, I'm tired of thinking for everybody, I'm tired of thinking for me. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Mary, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Of course, I would love to start off by talking a little bit more about your upbringing. I know that you grew up in East Cleveland, Ohio. I know it was also far from easy uh, and you faced many, several challenges and doubts from other others. Uh, I would like to start off there, actually. Uh, I, I love listening to these stories because those are some of the most imp most impactful stories uh, for lis for listeners to listen. So, can you please share more about you know your childhood and some of those challenges and doubts you faced early on? Yeah, absolutely. So, I grew up with not the best relationship with my biological mother, and honestly, until the age of fourteen, I didn't really know. Like, I haven't, I didn't meet my real father, which I mean. We moved to Indianapolis uh, very young. My mom was chasing another relationship. And so when I ended up back in Cleveland, Ohio with my dad, it was literally from me not feeling like I was going to make it in Indianapolis after going through so much in my life, you know, losing friends, like from gun violence and all of this stuff. Um, that I literally wrote a letter to my dad and was like, hey, if you don't come save me, I won't be here. And it wasn't until that time when he decided, okay, I'm going to go and save my daughter. And so he picked me up from Indianapolis and literally that's the first time I ever remember having a experience with my biological father. And from there, I was raised in Cleveland. I mean, obviously I went to college there. I finished high school there, but life didn't just get easier because I moved to Cleveland. I went through a lot. You know, I changed schools. I was in a new city. No, no one knew who I was. So it was just a lot to deal with. And also that relationship that was a struggle for me with my biological mom. Now, what I can say is God stepped in and allowed my cousins, uh, who are much older than me, to allow me to live in their home and raise me just like I was their own. So that's where I felt like I, 
was able to get my feet in the ground and understand who I was and and what I, my beliefs were and understand my relationship with God, you know, those people really curated that relationship with me knowing who I am and really understanding, you know, what I wanted to do next. So I still have a great relationship um, with my biological parents. Those relationships started to get better. But my godparents are who really stepped in and kind of like, you know, you really can't see the picture when you're in it. So they were able to be the outside uh, like photographer and like putting yeah. me in the perfect angles uh, on where I needed to start in my life. So what people probably don't know is um, my senior year of high school, I lost my biological sister on my father's side to suicide. Um, and that was very challenging for me. It was, you know, the first time that I experienced death, like right in front of my face and had to fight through that, you know, so it allowed me to understand what I'm willing to do and not willing to do. And still to this day, 35 years old, I've never drank alcohol. I've never smoked wow. um, because of that moment when I had to open up a letter and read my sister's autopsy. Um, and I literally made a commitment to myself at 17 years old that I would never do it. And I haven't done it yet. Wow. Well, thank, thank you so much for sharing that, that story. Uh, it's very personal, but it, it's so important and also very inspirational uh, to, to many people out there. I, since I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Cupcake Mafia. Yeah. So I think uh, many of us, or uh, if people know you, they probably know the story of Cupcake yes. Mafia and how you started it. And is, is that correct? You started that company with $300? I started it with $300 and in Cleveland, Ohio. So most people think that I moved to Atlanta, Georgia and started a business. No, I started it in Cleveland, Ohio, actually in my dad's living room. Um, wow. The idea came about, obviously I was... It was after college or it was like right after college. And I was really figuring out what I wanted to do. I went on tour. It's a long story, but to make a long story short. I went on tour. I was able to make a little bit of a bunch of money, more money than I ever seen uh, on tour. And then I came home and I wanted to buy like a pink G, a pink Range Rover. And okay. my dad was like, no, you are you crazy? Like, use this money and put it into something, whether it's paying off your student loans or starting a business. And so I partnered with this guy that I knew had retail stores um, in Cleveland, Ohio. And so he started to take me to this trade show called Magic Trade Show in Vegas. So I was going there, I was going there, and I was seeing the need for a clothing brand. There was one other brand that did this, and it was doing very well in our store. And immediately they just stopped selling t-shirts and they immediately transitioned to selling swimsuits. So what do I do as a newfound business owner where I have customers that are asking me every single day, when is this shirt coming back? When are the shirts coming back? I was like, maybe I need to make a shirt brand like to mm -hmm. replace the revenue that we're missing in our retail store. So I literally uh, created a brand called Cupcake Mafia with three hundred dollars. I didn't even believe it in myself, right? Wow! I literally yeah. asked one of my friends. I was like, "Yeah, I'm thinking about doing it," but even though I seen the revenue from the other brand, like I knew the potential of what it could be. I seen it right in front of my face. Like as I'm doing my PNL every week, I see what the potential could be. But sometimes even though you may see the potential right in front of your face, you still second guess, do you have the potential, right? Mm. So for me, it was second guessing, did I truly have the potential to execute what these other people did? So I went to one of my friends who had a, a successful t-shirt line and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's $300 to get started, but I don't know, like that's a lot of money to waste. And they're like, you don't believe in yourself? I was like, nope. And they were like, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll give you $150. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I'll give you $150. And once you make your money back, just give me my $150. Like, and so having that person to say, like, now I had their money, right? So I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God, this has to be successful. So sometimes you just need people around you that will push you out of your element. So I started this brand with $300 in four years. We took it to a $2.4 million brand. Um, and nowadays it seems like making a million dollars is easy. Like 
I see all the Instagram gurus. Oh, I made a million in a day. I made a million in an hour. Well, back then it was not easy and influencers were not a thing. It was like real celebrities or that's it, right? Um, so we just really had to get creative and find ways to scale. And so mm -hmm. the business scaled. I got a multi-million dollar uh, purchase order from Forever 21 at Magic Trade Show uh, in 2014, 2015. And uh, that purchase order sent me on a striving to get investors or partners in what you would call mm -hmm. it. Because investors in the retail world is different than investors in like the business world, right? So I was looking for a distribution company that could distribute my brand to all of these other retail stores, Foot Action, Ladies Foot Locker. And so once I found that partnership, I thought that my life was made, right? Yeah. Um, it didn't go that way. Six months later, I found myself fired from my own company um, because they wanted to transition the brand in another way to gain revenue. And I did it. I wanted to keep our organic growth uh, and our organic business model. I didn't want to sell to off price retailer. So they felt like I wasn't a good CEO because I should have cared more about the mm -hmm. money than I cared about the people or that I cared about the buyers that had grew with me so long, you know? So I got fired from my business, ended up on an airbed and literally was in like fight or flight mode. Uh, and, and six months later, I was able to uh, start all of these mini little businesses that you see. From that airbed, I started Girl Mob. I started the Ice Agency. I started the Bakery Cowork. We had a business plan. Like, I was just like, you know, God, if you get me back on top, I will let everyone else know that you are the reason that I'm here today. So, I mean, it was, it. I, you know, when people ask me nowadays, they're like, how do you have so many successful businesses? It wasn't because it was just, a, it wasn't an option. Like, it was literally like, I have five employees that I'm trying to pay every Friday. Like, one of these businesses have to collectively have to be able to get these employees paid, you know? So that's where I was when I started Cupcake Mafia. Now I've sold it. And I'm super excited to say that I have like, you know, two exits under my belt successfully. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Do, do you find it that your success for all these mini businesses comes from your childhood where you grew up in a very low income household because you faced uh, various sorts of struggles in childhood that there is no other option. You just got to do it. Is that the case or, or not? I, I, personal, I, in your personal view? Yeah, definitely. I think that when you make it from nothing, you want to leave with something, you know, like you want to leave this world with something. No one wants to stay at zero. Like, I don't know. Anybody. Yeah. Even if you, even, you know, the person at on the end of the street that may have zero right now, it's not, they're not comfortable with that. They want more yeah. out of life. I just think that there are some people that are going to, you know, make it their job, make it their life's mission to leave more, to leave with more. And that's really my life's mission is not only for myself and my family to leave, you know, this earth with more, but what about the people around me? What about my employees? What about people that just, I come in contact with? Can I push mm -hmm. them to want to leave the world with more than what they came in it with? You know, just because we were born with nothing, that don't mean we have to have nothing in our thirties and in our forties, like you, you, if you buckle down and hunker in on what it is you're trying to do with this life, the world is endless. Yeah. 
I, I really love that you mentioned the word employees several times uh, by now. I do want to take a I do want to make a note of that. Uh, I, I you know I, I I find it fascinating when I hear the, the cla- like you know like entrepreneur stories that come from a very low income household. I'll very uh, very briefly share my experience as well, if you allow me to. Uh, I also uh, grew up in uh, poverty in a low income household in New York City. My parents immigrated here, uh, but you know I was lucky in many senses because just because you live in poverty, there are different layers of poverty. Uh, yes. There's functional poverty and dysfunctional poverty. So I was still fortunate in many cases, but uh, I think growing up in poverty uh, has allowed uh, really helped me. As you mentioned, you have several different uh, companies now, and we also are immersed in you know several different companies. But it gives you a lot of resilience. Like there is no other option. Uh, I remember starting Argo Prep, which is really uh, our main company that owns all these subsidiaries over here. Uh, I started Argo Prep with sixty dollars in my pocket, uh, and I was a college student, and everybody made. Nobody believed in me. Nobody. My mom didn't believe in me. My friends didn't believe me. Believe in me, and they were kind of right to do so, <laughs> because at that time I wanted to create a workbook that would be used in like um, in schools and institutions. So this is like a textbook. So it's 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 just very weird. Just like, what are you talking about? You're a college student. You want to write a book? You want to write a a math workbook? You know, science workbook? A, a, almost like a textbook that students would. Who are you? You haven't even finished your undergrad program. Get the you know get out of here. <laughs> and so we just did it. I mean, we just did it, and somehow it's a miracle. And you know, it really played off. And we have an amazing team here. We have a, a team of fifty employees that we that we feed. But I, I like that you. I, I really enjoyed. I, I really like that you mentioned the word employee several times because that's all I think about. You have like that that paycheck is coming up like. Can we pay them? Um, it's it's very important. It's always top of mind for me. Like, are they? You know, I think I think um, owners get a bad reputation sometimes. Yes. Like, oh, they don't care. They only care about the profits. Um, some owners are evil and have misconstrued that, but in reality, a lot of owners or s- a- small business owners, even if you're doing ten million dollars in revenue, that's actually considered s- small business. A small small business. Yep. Uh, it's we we care deeply about our employees because their lives are at your hands and you get you know you know the family and you know if they have kids and they rely a lot on you uh but i i want to i want to go ahead and talk about uh your best selling book which is the icing on top ain't always sweet i love that i i love that title why is the icing on top not always sweet I mean, I think that most people look at my life or they look at my Instagram or they look at, you know, whatever snippet reel they may see of my life. And they're like, oh, my God, it's so glamorous. Like she has this. She's done this. Mm -hmm. She's opening this or that. And it's like, yeah, but what about the days when it was what about the, the clips that aren't posted on Instagram? You know, what about the moments that you don't see what about the nights when you know like I I posted last year or the year before last when I gave my company's first bonuses like it was new it was end of the year and I was giving out company bonuses and like I was literally holding the envelopes and shaking you know and like everybody was like oh my god this is such a big accomplishment and like you should be so proud of yourself but what about those years before that, when I couldn't make payroll and I had to like mm. ask my dad for $50 and ask my cousin yeah. and ask for my aunt and pawn jewelry and, you know, like things like that. Like, what about those times that you guys don't see? I think for me, you know, the reason why I wanted to name that title, the icing on top isn't always sweet because you may look at this beautiful cake, but you didn't know that it had to be whipped, right? And it had to be like... You, you had to hit it, right? To make it flat and you had to shape it. You had to mold it and you had to do all of these things. You had to crack an egg. Like the, yeah. if you think about it, if you think about life, it's almost like baking a cake. You got to be whipped. You got to be shaped. You got to be baked. You put it in an oven 365 degrees, right? You like feel like, oh, I'm about to die in this. I'm about to die. How many of my entrepreneurs that are watching this have felt like, 
I'm not going to make it through this moment, right? Mm -hmm. But then once the cake is out and it's all frosted up, this is when you see success, right? This is when people see the success of life. Like, oh, she got the car that she wanted. Oh, she opened that business. Oh, wow. She has furniture. She has employees. Like, this is when you see success is when you put the icing on and it sprinkles and you're like, wow, this cake looks so good. Oh, my God. It, it happened overnight. And it's like, really? I went through eggs being cracked on me. I was in hot pressure, right? And then I had to be shaped. I had to be molded. They had to whip me into shape just to get to where I am. So sometimes the icing on top isn't always sweet. I I love that. Is that, is that, a, is that a social media issue? That people, people, I mean, listen, you're, you're exactly right. You open a profile, you look at the story. Oh my God, she's on a jet. Oh my God, uh, look at her studio space. But, and, but they completely forget about the years of hard work and failure and sweat, blood, tears. Is, is, is that, is that, is, is that, a, where, how, why, why don't people, why don't more people recognize the hardship? uh when when they see the when they see the success is that a social media issue or i don't think it's a social media issue honestly i still experience it within my own family and friends and they know me right i think that it's just a we would like to look at the earth or the world with rose colored glasses like we like mm. to look at the the shiny objects or we like to look at the more glamorous parts of the role right even when i hire people to go back to employees like i'm always like this is not glamour it's like yes you're gonna be our social media manager but can you post three thousand can you do this like no just look at the glamour of oh my god i'm gonna set up a ring light and make reels all around the building like no yeah. i think that it's it's what the perception that people just want to see the the glamorous side of it and i always tell people like and everybody that's listening or uh, watching this podcast like check on your people for real like ask them mm -hmm. how are you doing for real don't just say how are you doing you know that they're going to give you a canned answer you know they're going to be like it's fine oh i'm doing great the business is great really what's going on because last year i went through a, a situation where I didn't know what burnout was, right? I've never experienced mm. it before. I'm always the person that has high energy. I'm always creative. You come to me, I can answer every problem. But I went through a situation where I'm like, why? Okay, God, show me what it is you want me to be doing in this moment because literally I'm tired of thinking for everybody. I'm tired of thinking for me. And in that situation, on Instagram, you wouldn't have noticed that anything was wrong. Even mm -hmm. in my daily life, yeah. I, mean, I had at that point 40 employees. My 40 employees coming into my office, they wouldn't have noticed anything was wrong. It wasn't until you asked me, hey, how is today going for you? Or, hey, is there anything that I can take off your plate? Then I'm able to open up and tell you. But most people just go along the days saying, oh, she's good. And even... It's so funny, even January, when I was finally open to talk about my burnout, because I was literally on the, the end of it, right? Like, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling like myself again. I want to talk about this. And I was in a conference room with all of my employees. And I'm like, listen, guys, I'm excited about this new journey, this, this podcast that I'm launching, and I need your help, right? Like, I don't really know I got it. I don't really know if I have it yet. Like, I need your help. And guess what they said? You got it. You got it. You're mm. good. Oh, my God. Yeah. We've been following you for so long. We know that you got this. You don't need us. Yes, I do. So yeah. it's two sides. One is the person that is looked at as successful. Are you opening an, up enough to show the no, non-glamorous sides, right? Because if you don't, that's all people are going to see about you. So that's why I try to make it my work and my job on my social platforms to let people know that this is not all glorious. It's not all glamorous all the time, right? And then for the people that may be looking at the glamorous people as, oh my God, everything is perfect. You guys have to know that like, this is real world reality. And in real world, like even on the heart monitor, on your heart monitor, if it's not going up and down, right? What is it? Right. You're dead. Yeah. Right? If you, 
You're just not going up and down. So that's life. Like if you're not going up and down, if you're not mm-hmm. facing the ups and downs in life, then you're dead. There's never going to be a straight path to anything you want in life. There's not going to be one straight path. God, if God made the heart to go up and down, you, you don't think you don't think he made your life to go up and down? You would be bored if everything was just handed to you and give it to you and everything was glamorous. You would be bored and you would have the most boring story on earth that everything was handed to me, everything was given to me, and that's why I'm successful. Yeah. Most people that are successful have those ups and downs. So I think it's all about it's all about both parts. The one that is looking at the person has as having the most glamorous life. To be able to say, wow, there may be something that she had to face and I'm going to figure out how I can learn from those things. And the person that is considered to have the glamorous life to show the behind the scenes of is not really as glamorous as you guys may think. Mm. Yeah, no, I love that. And speaking about your podcast, I want to kind of talk about your podcast since we just you just mentioned that you recently launched your podcast, right? I would love to le- learn a little bit more about your podcast and what kind of content you create there. Yeah, so I think that we all are on this journey to figure out what is a secret recipe? Like, how do I get there faster? How do I get there stronger? How do I get there smarter? Like, what is a secret recipe to success? Even myself, I've been on that journey, right? I'm like, oh my God, people look at me and they're like, wow, she's grown all these businesses. She's so young, but I've been doing this 11 years. Like, Mm. I'm going to my 12th year as an entrepreneur, you know? So I want to know, how do I get there faster? How do I get there more successful? How do I get there smarter? What can I learn? So I started a podcast called The Secret Recipe just to really be able to sit with others and find out what is the secret recipe. Some people's secret recipe is God. Some people's secret recipe is the way that they market or the way that they use relationships to their benefit. Like, so on my podcast, you will hear, I get deep with people. I'm not just, it's not just a educational thing where you will learn like, oh, five tips, but you're also going to hear their stories and you're going to be, um, you're going to embark on a journey. Every episode you are embarking on a journey of how this person developed a secret recipe that got them to where they are now. Mm, I love that. Uh, what uh, I know you have several companies, so we're uh, let's. I'll ta- I'll now move on to uh, Girl Mob. So I know. Uh, so what inspired you to create Girl Mob? It's an online community dedicated to helping women achieve their dreams. Uh, what is it right now, and uh, how do you see this platform evolving in the future? Yeah. So actually, I'm going to take it a little bit back and I'm going to explain all of the companies, how they started, why they started, because they all merged together. And if we segment them out, people always think like, okay, she has this, she has this. And really, they just all merge together. They're just different names, different audiences um, and different really price points, essentially. So I got fired from my company, you guys, and uh, I didn't know what to do. I literally was looking for jobs one day. Like, I didn't know. I'm like, I haven't made a resume in years. Oh my God. Like, I don't know what to do. And so I called one of my friends. Her name is Alex Wolf and she is a tech uh, philosopher. And I called her and, and I was like, Alex, I need your help. I'm really, really stressed out. And what you don't know is I was fired from my company and I'm literally sleeping on an airbed above my retail store. Not that I don't have the money, but I'm using every single dollar to go back into fighting this company to get my brand back. And she was like, okay. I was like, so what should I do? And I'm like sweating. I'm like in tears. I've never shared that with anyone except my family. And so I'm like, what is she going to say? Is she going to say, girl, best buy is hiring. Like, what is she going to say? So she's like, girl, you built a million dollar brand. You built a multi-million dollar brand. If you build one brand, do it again. I'm like, what do you mean do it again? She's like, use exactly what you did before and do it again with something that you love i'm like okay so literally the light bulb popped on in my head that wow everybody for years has been saying you're a great marketer you're a great marketer you need to be a marketer i'm like i don't even know what marketing is essentially i know that i do it for me but i don't think that i can make this into a company like people will pay me to tell them how to get in front of their audience like what is little did i know One of the people that were interested in 
of me marketing them was the company that essentially I got fired for, right? Like <laughs> it was a brand uh, called City Trend. It's a it's a it's a store called uh, City Trend, which is an off price, right? And I knew where I wanted Cupcake Mafia to go, and I knew that it wouldn't go where I wanted it to go if I sold it to off price. So in the negotiation process, I created a whole nother brand for City Trends, but my partners didn't want to sell it. They wanted to sell my brand, Cupcake Mafia, to City Trends. So City Trends was just so happy that I put this full plan together to give them a brand of their own, essentially. And then I ended up getting fired for it. And they, they now they couldn't get any of the streetwear brands. And that's what they wanted to do was to be able to enhance their junior department. So they bring me on as a consultant to enhance their juniors department while opening up uh, areas in their streetwear essential essentially division, right? So that was like my first client. I didn't know. I was like, oh my God, I have an agency. And then what I realized is people needed, small businesses need the same thing that I was doing for the larger corporations, which was a full done for you service of being able to be a brand strategist, tell them what to do, what to say, how to show up, how to get in front of their audience. So that's how the ISA agency was created. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have three different tiers. So anybody that has $5,000 or less, you are in our a la carte division. Anybody that has $5,000 to $15,000, you're in our premium division. And anybody that has $15,000 plus is in our elite white glove service uh, division. So we have three different divisions to be able to service all clients because the worst thing you can have is a great idea and bad marketing. Mm. Oh, that's how the ISA agency came about. The second thing that I started was now that I have all of this information, right? I know how to start a brand, how to lose a brand, how to uh, fight for a brand, like marketing, sales, profit and loss. I knew all these things. And the one thing that I told God, I, and I think that I've already mentioned it in this interview is like, I promised to God when I was on the air bed, that if he put me back on the top, I would let everyone else know about him. And I would let everyone else, I would make sure the girls or the people that follow me don't go through the things that I went through. I would share mm -hmm. my story. So I created a digital platform, which was like a membership because I, in that time of being on my airbed, I started to do classes in my retail store for $25, right? And this $25 was literally to help keep the lights on in mm -hmm. the building. So I have these classes and it started with like five people and 25 people and 50 people. And they were like, I, I see people traveling from all over to come to my retail store and learn for $25, right? And so they they eventually say, they're, they're start asking me, why isn't this online? Like, I would love to be able to get all the knowledge out of your brain and like see it, you know, be able to replay these classes. I'm like, wow. So I created Girl Ma, which was initially named something different. But I created Girl Ma, which is the idea of, yes, we are a bunch of girls, but the focus is on you. Like you go to college with a bunch of people, but when you're in college, you're the one that walks away with that degree, right? You're the one that walks away and says, okay, I was in a class with a bunch of people, but I took the knowledge and used it for my own benefit. And now I have that degree or now I have that multi-million dollar business. So I created Girl Ma, but I wanted it to be super affordable. It's $49.99 mm -hmm. a month. And literally we bring in over, I don't know, hundreds of experts every single year that explains every single month we have live classes and we have replays and we have okay. in-person events um, for women, all women, no matter what you do, if you need that community and support, that's how Girl Mom was created, right? Then... Um, I became, as the business grew, I became a member of the wing and I didn't really feel welcomed. Like, um, I didn't, you know, I started to Google and research like, oh, I understand why people weren't really happy with the company culture at the wing, which was a co-working space in LA. And so mm -hmm. I was like, you know, traveling around, wanting to just get in the room with other women, like, and learn what I could. And so I built a business plan in 2016. I built a business plan for what is now the bakery co-work. Um, mm -hmm. And then the retail store that I had, which was Cupcake Mafia, it was so near and dear to my heart. That's, I mean, I spent six months on an airbed 
figuring out my life there. Um, and I built all these businesses. I didn't want to let it go. So I turned that into a selfie museum. So that is now Girl My Museum from Girl My the Digital Community. Um, and now we have the Bakery Cowork, which is the largest female focused co working space for female entrepreneurs. Wow. So um, all of them go together, right? Like if mm, you yeah. are a person, I believe in the power, empowering women. I just think that. When I started 11 years ago, there was no one that could give me this information. No one could support me, help me out. So my heart is really for women. I love, you know, I like men, but my heart is for the women. And of course, when that woman is entering into the journey of entrepreneurship, they need first information. They don't have the money, right? They need information. Then they figure out, okay, I want to start a boutique. Now they need a marketing company that's going to be like, I'll design your website, I'll design your logo, I'll do all those things for you. And then as they grow and elevate, they're going to want to do in-person events, a photo shoot, an event space. And that's where the bakery comes in. So really, all the businesses that I have, they help my customer go along her journey. So Mm -hmm. instead of us referring her to another marketing agency or an event space or a photography studio, my customer journey can be complete with literally all of the businesses that we have to offer. Thank you so much for walking me through that because that that makes much more sense. And I completely agree with you with the lack of, I mean, there needs, this is, this is, you're doing very, in, a very important work because you're, you're absolutely correct uh, with the limited amount of information or resources dedicated to women in the entrepreneurship space. Uh, data does not lie. If you take a look at venture capital funding and all the funding, uh, it's hideous. I mean, that's what it is. Um, we talk about it all the time. There's no change. There's no change. Uh, in fact, I mean, like 20, 2021, we saw a huge spike in general in funding overall, but more woman-led, woman-led companies were getting funded. But take a look at the data right now. It went right back down. Investors... All those investors that promised uh, to do uh, to to invest into specific groups, they're going back on their word. Yes, we're going backwards. We're I mean, all this talk, no action. It's- and so now that I'm in the raising, I'm in my seat round of raising for the bakery, um, and people are like, you know, there's two sides. The two sides are. Uh, someone is like, oh, you have all of the money you built it. You don't need money. Why would you give someone a percentage of your company or your idea process, right? And then the other side of it is um, those that are like, oh my God, you know, the wing uh, took a huge plummet in regards to women and co-working. How can you combat that, right? And my answer is that, I wish that investors actually took a look at the person in the body of work that that requires that investment, right? Like for me, when people think of of me and they say, oh, well, what's different between the bakery and the wing? How, How won't you fail? And I said, because I've already grew a company, lost the company, bought it back, uh, exited that company. And then on top of that, I've already built a $16 million company and, and, and fought through all of adversity to do that. So if I'm not going to lose my money, I'm sure not going to lose your money. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, the bakery is already one year in and fully profitable, fully profitable with no loans, no investors. And we already have hundreds of members. We've serviced over 10,000 people in one year in our building. So Look at the stats. Look at the numbers. I'm sorry that you may have invested in another um, business or another founder and they didn't know what they were doing or they didn't have a body of work that showed that they could um, use this investment and actually grow it. But if I've already done it for myself, then what do you think that I'm going to do for you? What's a decision? What what was what was the how, how did you get to the decision that you wanted to raise a seed round for the bakery? Um, honestly, I think that when I'm looking at my competitors or when I'm looking at like WeWork and Regis and Industrious, it's all about scaling fast. It's how quickly mm. you get to that market, right? And there are amazing 
other female co-working spaces um, all over the world, but there's like one and there's two and there's three. So in order for you to really take up the market share, essentially, you have to be cap- quick, yeah. you have to be fast and quick to market. So I, I mean, obviously there there's so much that I can do with my own capital, but really getting investors behind me that know more about you know the space, more about scalability. Um, that's really, really important for me. And also, like, honestly, the challenge is for me, it's to show more minority women that we can raise capital. We don't have to do it alone. We don't have to scale businesses and be 100% profitable and have no one backing us and have no, you know, cap table of advisors that say, oh, you should do it this way. Okay, this is your five-year plan. All right, this is how we exit. More minority women need to be sitting at the table, not on the menu. 100%. This is... Uh, that's without a hundred percent. And, uh, yeah, in that model, you're right. It's a very capital intensive, uh, uh, model. If you're trying to, uh, penetrate the market, uh, uh, venture capital is the only route, especially if you want to eat up market share on that route. Um, and so you're still on your seed round, right? Have you closed that round yet? Or you're, it's, it's an, okay. We have, it's, we have investors circled, but we are now collecting it. And honestly, I was very nervous, you know, like being a, uh, being an entrepreneur that has grown several businesses to, you know, the multi-million dollar range and doing it all alone without any, you know, one over my back or asking me any questions and being able to develop, you know, very amazing companies. I was kind of questionable on, was that the need? And then I started mm-hmm. to think about who would I impact by just being one. Right. By just being one bakery co-work in Atlanta, which is the largest, what, who am I impacting? Right. Like, what is Mm -hmm. my ultimate vision for the bakery? I want to impact hundreds of thousands of women, no matter what their race or their um, political background is or their demographic. Like, I want to impact women just to understand the power of community and the power of resources. And I can't do that by myself. Mm. I, yeah, I, I, I want to ask, uh, I, I just remember, I know you did a collaboration with uh, Grant Cardone and Elena Cardone, right? Uh, I wanted to ask you, what was that experience like working with them on the 10X Mastermind project? Yeah, so Elena became my client in 2021. I think, yeah, 2021. And honestly, I loved her. I've loved her and I've loved Grant for so long. Um, You know, when we were on that airbed, my husband used to listen to Grant Cardone all the time. And I'm like, babe, oh my God, like I'm trying to get off this airbed. Like I don't need to know about real estate (laughs) right now. Or, you know, and and it was, it was so powerful. It was so impactful, you know, when 2020 came along and I was able to throw my husband a conference and bring out all of the people that motivated him and motivated us to initially to essentially get off that airbed, right? And one of those people were Grant Cardone. And so we were able to book him for a conference in Atlanta, my husband's conference, and put on a whole thing. And in 50 days, we sold like 2,500 tickets. And that's where the relationship kind of started. Um, Mm. And I ended up going to Elena Cardone's conference And I seen some things and areas in which I felt like I could help her with. My company could help her with. And um, I became her brand strategist. And we literally conquered some amazing projects between my team and her team. We really were able to give her a different perspective on social media. And I love them to this day. They're, you know, she's so, both of them are so inspirational. But again, I told you my heart is for the women. So... Like yeah. being able to work alongside of Elena and Grant was very inspiring and it allowed, and it made me think so much bigger, you know, going mm-hmm. to their conferences and being in their masterminds, um, even as just their marketing or their consulting marketing agency and just being around them. I learned so much. I mean, I literally have books piled up here from uh, mm. um, of things that I've learned and how I was able to strategize. So just being able to be the, you know, work along someone as powerful as them with them having 
you know, their own in-house team and employees and still trusting my company to do, um, you know, some of their marketing, it really meant a lot for me. And I'm super excited about, you know, just our continued relationship and where we go in the future. Yeah. What's one piece of advice that you would give to all the women that are listening? Actually, our, our audience is actually mostly, a lot of our audience is teachers. And by default, if you look at the statistics, because we're in K to eight space, in the K to eight space, uh, uh, women uh, far uh, overtake men uh, uh, significantly in the staffing ratio. Uh, if what advice can you give to women who are on the cusp? You know, they are looking to start something, but they're they're scared. They you know they don't want to pursue it. Uh, any 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 advice for them on, on on people who are passionate about this, but just a little too a, 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 a little scared to start. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was that same girl. I was so scared to start my business. And if I could do it all again, the one thing that I would do differently is I would literally figure out what service that I'm good at. If I, if you could have told me mm. 11 years ago that I was an amazing marketer and people would call me like, oh, the Chris Jenner, Olivia Buff of marketing, uh, which was coined to me, I didn't coin the phrase, but if someone could have told me that 11 years ago, like you're an amazing marketer, you need to start a marketing agency, that's what I would have done, right? Because that mm. I can manage and I can handle without any staff. Like I can pop my computer up and, and develop a website. I can bring my phone I can bring my camera. I can do a photo shoot. Probably not as best, as good as my team, but I can do the service, right? When I got started with retail, I was so inventory heavy. I was literally mm -hmm. robbing Peter to pay Paul. Like, okay, take this PO, the money, the deposit that they gave me from this PO to pay for this PO. Take this PO and pay for this PO. It's like, if you have a service that you offer and so many people are right now, you're probably listening. You're like, oh my God, my friend's been asking me to do, you know, resume building or this or that. Like, what is that service that you already are doing? And most of the time you're doing it for free. That was me when I started in the music industry. All of my clients, or I didn't know they were clients at the time, but all of the people that I were was around would be like, okay, I'm, I'm coming up with this song. How can I get it out to my audience? I'm like, okay, we're going to go on Vine. We're going to do this. We're going to wear pink shirts. We're going to, and I didn't know that that was actually building out a marketing campaign for their song, mm. you know? And so I would tell you like, what is the service that you can truly offer to someone for, for, without having to spend anything like you can do it off of your mind you can do it within your chair within your wheelhouse you don't need any inventory because most people i've noticed you know now coaching and mentoring for the last five years um i noticed that most people fail in their business because they had to go and buy something and the middleman yeah. is what messed them up right like the vendor mm. didn't ship my product or oh ups was closed and it didn't make it to the client like there's always a middleman in business if you can do a b2c business business, meaning you, to your consumer, right? Or to your customer, um, right directly and not have any middleman and you offer that service, your business is going to grow 10 times. Wow. That's, that is actually really good advice. I just, you, you, you're going to give me nightmares today about when you just mentioned about the purchase orders, uh, using one purchase order to pay with the other purchase orders, because that brings back a lot of personal memories for ourselves. We, we, I mean, now we we deal with purchase orders all the time nationwide from schools and schools take forever to pay they t they do like net 90 like net 120 120 days like even on These 120 purchase... it's still 121 it's still 125 exactly. <laughs> exactly it can be 6 months if they if you lose your like sometimes they issue checks we don't receive it then you have to fill out a form then you have to get it notarized then you send it back then they will send out another check i mean it's it's a brutal brutal cycle uh, i just wanted to mention that when you when you when you mentioned that uh, yeah, a lot I of memories got flooded there <laughs> I, I went through it all and and if i could go back again and i honestly feel like this is the most imp that's one of the most important things about my story is that I started with a t-shirt line, you know, and I thought when we made $2.4 million, like I was jumping, well, I kind of was jumping up and down. I kind of was scared because I was like, whoa, like 
we did a lot of work. Is this it? And is and then if we make four million dollars, how much manpower or work are we gonna have to do? Like we made two point four million dollars, and we didn't. We have one little retail store, like three thousand square feet, you know. So then in twenty twenty, my marketing agency does sixteen million dollars, and it's all off of services. Now, granted, yeah. it was blood, sweat, and tears in twenty twenty to be able to work with the type of clients that I work with and literally pushing through. I mean, I remember some sleepless nights. I remember like, I don't even remember sleeping. I remember there were nights where I was like, these projects have to close. So I, I was able mm. to do that, but it was still not, I couldn't blame anyone. I could only blame my team or myself. I couldn't blame UPS or the vendor right. or right. any of the other things. I couldn't say, oh, you know, the, the fabric or any of the things. Like I literally only could blame myself and my hmm. uh, resilience to get through it. Um, and then I also, from that, I learned what my capacity is, you know, because maybe, um, maybe it's not about the money, right? Like maybe it's not that you want to be a billionaire or you want to get right. to, you know, 20 million. Maybe it's, I actually want peace or I actually want freedom. And so when freedom comes, actually only working with five clients a year or 10 clients a year where, you know, sometimes the shiny object is money. The shiny object is that, oh, if I had 20,000, you know, in my bank account, how much my life would be so much better. But when you get to 20,000, you have $20,000 worth of problems. Then you realize, actually, I would be okay with 10 because it's going to come with the less problems. And I actually like happiness and I like peace. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, again, you're going to go on those, that roller coaster. And for me, that's what it's been for me, like learning every single day. And then the last thing I want to say is like a slow rise to the top is better than a fast fall to the bottom. Whatever mm -hmm. you are doing in your life right now, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, just understand that a slow rise to the top is better than a fast fall to the bottom because every single year you're able to learn and you're able to take on what you learned and use it for the next following year. If you just jump up to the top, right? Imagine when you had that one workbook. If you had 100,000 orders when you launched, you would have dropped right back down, right? You were not yeah. ready to take 100%. those inventory. You didn't have the staff. You didn't have the manpower. You didn't have the shipping. You didn't have a warehouse. You're shipping in your closet. Like you have one workbook and then you get 100,000 orders. Now you're like, Mom, can I use your living room? Like, you know, like, so yeah. even though people want overnight success, it's truly not, it's, it's truly not set up for longevity. It's truly not set up for legacy. Think about all the one hit wonders that made it to the charts and very fast. You've never heard of them, but you're in the car, you're singing that song, ah, like, and then next thing you know, you're like, where is that guy? Like, what happened? Yeah. Because he didn't have 20 songs that failed that taught him about once he gets the one hit how to keep it up so that's that what is <laughs> that's amazing advice that is amazing advice seriously every all of us just want to get you know make, create a multi-million dollar company tomorrow right i want to start it today get to make a website and tomorrow i'm just going to magically make it uh, yeah. that's, that, that, but yeah, the faster you gr the faster you 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 grow, um, in in this sense, uh, you, you're most likely going to fail. Uh, yeah. Most likely, definitely. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for your time, uh, spending some time with me today. I I have uh, one last question for you, which is, uh, who has been the strongest or most inspiring person in your life, and what lessons have you learned from them? Um, I would definitely say, hmm. Honestly, I would say my dad, you know, like now that I'm older and can see how impactful he's been in my life, you know, he just turned 79 this year. Oh my God. Wow. Like, I can't even believe it. You know, next year he'll be 80. But I mean, my dad survived Vietnam. My dad was literally, you know, ripped from his porch. Like, oh, you're going to Vietnam. You are a great candidate mm. and made it back. Um, and then 
built his own company called Black on Black Crime to fight for, you know, what was going on, uh, the racism that was going on in our own country, you know? So, and he's still doing it to this day at 79 years old. Wow. You will still see him on the corner with the sign, you know, protesting, uh, you know, arguing with the police and, and being, uh, you know, building, um, camaraderie with the police as well. Um, so I think my dad, he's had several businesses. You know, he has that one barbershop in Cleveland where I'm like, dad, where are you going to let? He's like, nope, this is legacy, you know? So I think yeah. just seeing my dad survive so much. I'm actually, um, I've actually spent the last year helping my dad write a book um, oh. called, oh my God, what is the name of it? Let me find it right now. But I actually spent the last uh, year helping my dad write a book because I would be remiss to lose my father and not have the story. And I learned mm. so much about him. Like, you know, coming from Vietnam, they ha they were drugged. They, they were put on a lot of drugs because these kids never went through basic training or anything. Yeah. So they were like, oh, you know, you got to shoot all these people here, get these drugs. And so he came home and like, you know, had drug issues. And so for him to be so resilient and still, you know, become an entrepreneur, despite what, you know, our city or our state told him he, or the world told him he could be as a, you know, young black um, African-American male in this, in, in, in a country, in a world that is not what it is today. Um, I think that he inspires me the most. And so I'm helping him write a book called Surviving to Serve. Um, because he, I, I truly believe that his whole life has been about just surviving to continue serving the world. And that's what my wow. goal is too. I, I love that. I, I love both of your titles, uh, but that, that I love that title. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for sharing your story with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, your story is incredibly inspiring to, to, to so many people. And your passion for empowering others, specifically and particularly women, is, is truly remarkable. And it's much, much needed. Uh, I'm, I also want to quickly shout out that we're excited that you'll be speaking at the 2023 Black Enterprise Disruptor, Disruptor Summit in Atlanta from June 2 to 4. Uh, before we let you go, can you please let our audience know where can they learn more about you, the website, social media handle? Absolutely. You guys can find everything about me on my Instagram, Miss Skittles. That's M Z S K I T T L E Z. It's the name from high school. Um, and it's stuck with me all this time, so it can't go anywhere. Um, and then you can find the bakery co-work, the bakery co-work. The icing agency is our marketing agency. I would love to work with some of you guys. If you need that full concept, that idea on how do I strategize? How do I grow? How do I scale? We work with so many people to be able to do that. And then if you're a female entrepreneur or you are wanting to get into entrepreneurship and you need to know where to start, how to start, join Girl Mob. G-U, because we're a bunch of girls, but the focus is on you. G-U-R-L-M-O-B-B, Girl Mob. Wow. Th Mary, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I am super happy um, to have shared my story. And if you guys love this, please let me know. Like, hey, I heard you on this podcast. I love that. When people tell me, I heard you on this podcast and your story was amazing. Like, I want to know that you've heard it. So if you are listening um, right now, go and comment on my last post on Instagram and tell me that you heard this podcast and what you took from it. I love that. Thank you so much. Bye.